Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our last live session for the 401 class. And then you have a nice, relaxing break for those of you who are jumping into 402, which looks like quite a number of people. Um, as I think I've mentioned, we've got two classes, the summer 401 class and this class, feeding into 402. So it's filled up pretty quickly. So for those of you who haven't signed up who are interested in signing up for 402, you probably want to get jumping on that quickly. Um, so you'll see that next week, which is our last week, is not is very light on the content. It's kind of fi finishing up the first part of this business plan, all the sheets that you have, finishing up the written part. There's no, very limited videos to see. So I know some of you have gotten a little bit behind on like this past week's assignment, but you should have time to catch up. Um, especially with those of you going into 402, there's a week between classes with nothing. So that's good catch-up time. Um, for those of you who are trying to get a jump on things, the 402 class will be accessible probably 10 days before the official start time. So you could probably get in and start uh, watching things. And um, I know for Portland State students, that's pretty important because you're, you felt like we started a little early and you needed some time to catch up. So hopefully that will help. So let's get going with tonight's topic. We are covering distribution, a very important topic for everyone. <laughs> and we're really lucky to have Chris Charles with us tonight who has many years of distribution experience in both craft side and wine, which you could consider craft also. So. So he's going to do the usual format where he'll give a slideshow, but um, and he will let you know his preferences for interruption. So does anybody have any questions about administrative stuff right now before Chris gets going? No? Everybody's okay? All right. Well, welcome, Chris, and thanks so much for coming tonight. You bet. Thanks. for having me. And I would say that uh, I'm more than happy to have questions come as we go. So feel free to interrupt. And uh, a little bit of background, I have been in the wholesale business distribution for 27 years. And I've worked uh, touching a little bit of the beer, the wine, and the spirits side. And worked throughout um, all sizes of businesses from a, a small startup that I started out of college where we were schlepping kegs and cases out of the back of a car until we grew up and became, a, you know, call it a full-size wholesaler and sold that business into a larger wholesaler. And then over time from that, that was sold into yet a larger wholesaler and graduated up to the point where here in the Northwest was operating in, in one of the largest wholesalers uh, in Oregon and Washington. So uh, hopefully that experience and that background will just be able to shed a little bit of light on different sizes of businesses and usually that's relevant to what we're talking about tonight because products go through life cycles as they're in their infancy and as they develop and become more on-premise driven and then ultimately into the retail market. So I hope that uh, that experience will help. So the, uh, the hope tonight to take you through a little bit of the three-tier system, why it exists, role of a wholesaler, uh, why wholesale is important overall, kind of what are some of the roles in wholesale so that you can see uh, how a career can be created in the wholesale business, everything from sales to warehouse to operations and finance, et cetera. Uh, a little bit about how wholesalers work. Uh, often, I think people look at them and think that they're a, a big black hole, that uh, people talk to them and they don't really understand how they work or what makes them tick. So I hope to unlock a few of those things for you as well. And then ultimately, what your role is as a supplier if you have a brand and what you need to do to be successful with your wholesaler uh, over time. Because it's, uh, I think that there's a, a notion in people's mind that uh, they have a brand and now it should take care of itself. And I think that the reality of, is that those days are, are done and that today's uh, wholesale environment is much more complex and it really takes an active ownership or management team from the producer to really be successful. So why does the three or tier system um, exist? You know, if you go back in time, it was a post-prohibition addition. And the idea was to take 
uh, what was you know perceived as and, and maybe rightfully so sort of uh, gangster mafia driven business and to really separate that out and to create three tiers that wouldn't allow any one tier to have influence over the next tier in the system uh, and I think you know my experience tells me that watching it work it's really worked very effectively there and with that it, it keeps a, a very level playing field between supplier uh, excuse me customer and then the end consumer and across all sizes of brands or producers and then ultimately there to help manage uh, and monitor rule and law and we'll talk about that at the very end there's a number of rules and laws that are, are differing across states but I think that the one thing that they're intended to do in specifically to the alcohol business is to provide a level playing field where big can fight it out with small and I think the practical reality is if many of those rules and laws were gone you would find yourself in a spot where the small brands would have a very difficult time even getting to market. And then what's the role of the wholesaler? Uh, you know, really, the primary and first one that's there is tax collection for all alcohol entering the states. And if you think about that, uh, from a government standpoint, it's a pretty significant point. And that is that if each individual state had to collect taxes from all the entities of either wholesalers, wineries, breweries, distilleries, and keep track of making sure that every input was accurate. Imagine the number of people that you would have in every state in the government trying to track all of that. So by shifting that as a burden to the wholesale tier, they instead have a whole series of finance and accounting people who are doing just that. So I like to say, you know, from a government a cost standpoint, it's a very effective way to keep the government from having to spend more money on things that are just simply that, uh, that collection of taxes. And then from a wholesaler's responsibility, access to the market, uh, geographical channel and rules that level the playing field. Geographically, when you look at a, a, any market, every state has a, an area that is difficult to service, whether that's an outlying geography, whether it's something that's across the lake or on an island, or sometimes it's just simply the geography of such a, a major city that getting to all parts of the city becomes very difficult simply due to traffic and people. When it comes to channels of trade, the access by the distributors to be able to provide access to every pub, tavern, uh, C store, convenience store out there, grocery store, and all the levels of service that it takes to get there, it's a, it's a very, very significant capital intensive business that the wholesaler fills. And then ultimately applying and implementing the rules and the laws that are out there across uh, for everyone and across all distributors doing that, again, I think it provides a very level playing field for, for everyone. Public safety, you know, there's a, a whole lot of license compliance that a wholesaler does, again, takes that responsibility off the government's hands and shifts it to the wholesaler and in all of these areas if wholesalers don't comply uh, ultimately you know they are the ones who are fined uh, for a lack of compliance so it's a it's a very good way to keep government costs down in the process of shifting that and ultimately a product recall uh, one of the things that a wholesaler does is all inbound shipments are recorded with date and times on all the products so as you guys saw probably in the news when corona had a recall recently uh, you know, a very unfortunate thing that everybody hates to see, but they were instantly able to isolate where those shipments had gone, and then from a wholesale level, they're able to find out what stores those went to, and so within, call it days, that product can be recalled, and when you think about public safety, that's pretty impressive that a bottle of beer that was produced in a location can get back in and accounted for, assuming it hasn't been consumed, um, that quickly. So a really important uh, component. And then lastly, the uh, sales multiplier effect. You know, a wholesaler should buy product from a manufacturer and should be there to do two things. One, sell to a customers, but also provide education for customers and end consumers along the way. And it's something that, you know, I think has a lot of improvements still necessary in it. 
with the wholesalers, but I know that uh, it's an area that when it's done right, and we'll talk about that in a bit, you can really utilize your wholesaler to get yourself into you know, far more customers than you could ever imagine if you tried to do it yourself. And lastly, technology. The technology that wholesalers can afford based upon representing a full portfolio of products is pretty darn great. And that technology is something that any one brand oftentimes could never afford because the cost of that capital is so expensive. I assume that my talking as we go here is uh, not too fast and that you guys will jump in if there's questions. So within wholesale, what, uh, what barrel production size does it become feasible to afford a distributor and what size is required uh, as a waste of money to pay an employee to self-distribute? You know, I would probably have to come back to that with a maybe a, a follow-up email. I don't think that I could answer that uh, just off the cuff, if that's all right. Yeah, and some people actually, we had to distribute when we started in Utah because there's no way that we could get to all parts of the states from Park City, which was way up north, down to Moab. Um, okay, so I'll have to remember to give you Ryan's email at the end. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy we'll to. take it off. Take Thanks, it Ryan. If we, if, we, if you want to just uh, copy this to end too, get his emails at the end. That'll help. So talking a little bit about uh, wholesale, there's really a few different areas that uh, I, I think some people just naturally think of sales and management. But there's also a whole uh, area within operations. And in the operations area, if you look at it, there's inbound freight, there's outbound freight, there's warehouse logistics, there's drivers, there's warehouse people. When you look at behind the scenes, sometimes people don't uh, remember or recognize that for every salesperson getting a case to the market out there selling, there's probably a team that's somewhere to the tune in, in, in our organization. You'll have another 500 people out there behind the scenes in our operations team getting those cases and kegs and, and uh, bottles pulled to get to the market. So pretty significant portion of the business. Uh, and then sales and management. As you look at sales, you know, it's really broken down into a couple of areas. It's broken down into the grocery channel, uh, so we'll call it the large uh, grocers, then convenience stores, where there's thousands typically of, of convenience stores in every market, the restaurants and taverns, uh, and that's really broken down even into some subcategories from there, uh, chain headquarters, and the chain headquarters is where there's a team of salespeople actually calling on those chain grocery stores, but at a corporate level. So when we talk about getting a product to market, not only do you have to start at the chain headquarter level, but you start there, and then it spills over to the individual account level uh, of each store in that chain. And I think that uh, oftentimes people miss that. They think, well, you know, there's a, I'll, I'll pick the store, there's a Safeway down the street, uh, and I'll go sell into it. And the reality of it is you can't do that. You need to get on a plane, you need to fly to Pleasanton, you need to make a, a call on that buyer, and hopefully over one or two set cycles, six times, six months or 12 months down the road, you might get in. But a, a, very, uh, uh, a very long process, and it's one where a distributor has a real leg up at getting in to know those buyers and has access to the buyers because they have such a wide portfolio that the buyers want to see them. So really it's an interesting area of the uh, business. Along with specialized roles from uh, sake specialists to Italian specialists to craft beer specialists uh, to spirit craft spirit specialists as well. And then finally merchandising, which is really the entry level for, for most people to get into the business and find out how, how the industry works, but it's usually a short stop for most people who want to quickly get up into sales and move through the organization. And then finally accounting, human resources, and a number of other aspects of the business. But like every business, there's many, many facets to it, and it's really interesting. You can truly create a, uh, you can create a career within the wholesale business. So Shane had a question, to, which Do I think we talked about earlier, that wholesalers actually, wholesalers actually sell for you. How does that interaction work, if so, with the buyer? 
So the, the reality on the chain side, no, that is part of the, the process of being a wholesaler. So there isn't a premium charge for that service. What you should expect from your wholesaler is the ability for them to sell into every channel of trade. And then the question is, you know, how do you help them do that? And we'll talk about that in a bit. But it's a full service that there aren't any add-on charges because you take on an additional area or you want to sell to a different customer. Uh, it should be full, one-stop uh, sell. So that's addressing Etheridge's question, too. Do I normally charge a premium for that kind of marketing? Yes, I'm sorry, that's what I was... Uh, oh, I mean, Shane said, do they actually sell for it? Oh, excuse me, I apologize, okay. I missed that one up above. It's hard, we look at a lot of info. Uh, so do actually, wholesalers actually sell for you? So that is the, that's the, uh, the, the big question of the day. I think that what you'll find is that, yes, wholesalers sell for you, but you really have to constantly work with them to keep them moving forward because what you'll find is that their portfolio is broad, and as a result, there's a lot of people tapping them on the shoulder, asking them to sell, and the number of wholesalers has decreased so dramatically that you really, as a supplier, have to be very, very active in working with your wholesaler to sell. Uh, it shouldn't be a given that I've sold it to the wholesaler, now it should come out of the warehouse. In fact, you know, quite the opposite. I always tell people to lead by example. Get it into your wholesaler, show them by selling it into accounts, and you'll be amazed at how that education that you provide them will kind of turn into a multiplier where it begins to sell kind of more on its own. And so answering the question, I, I, I'll go back to, do they normally charge a premium for that kind of marketing? No, everything should be included, whether you're selling to chain, sea store, restaurant, tavern, all of that should be included by going to your wholesaler, whichever wholesaler you uh, choose. So the, uh, the question. So from brewery to retail, what's the turnaround time to get product on the shelf? How old is the beer when it hits the shelf? Uh, well, it depends on how long the, the product has been sitting in a uh, brewery, a winery, or a distillery. Typically, anywhere in the U.S., cross-country, will go the furthest points, is going to take you seven days, typically, to get it point to point, and then probably another seven days to get it prepared to get into the system, quote, into an account. So there's no reason that you can't be well under 30 days um, for getting product to the shelf. And in, oftentimes, in adjusted time inventory, it can be two weeks uh, or less. Do you have any, any well, other thoughts on that? I mean, it depends. Like when we were in Utah, when we gave them our beer, they could get that beer out within two days from the warehouse in Salt Lake. Yep. So, but we were so close to them. Yeah, that's it. You so were, the farther away you get, I mean, 14 days would be the minimum for going from East Coast to West, West Coast, Coast or vice versa. So. Have the numbers decreased by merging into bigger companies? Uh, the, uh, which number are you the asking? Number of wholesalers. Number of wholesalers. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of wholesalers is, is down dramatically in most states. Uh, you probably have two mega distributors and then there's a number of smaller distributors, and those smaller distributors, typically there's then one more, what I'll call a mid-sized distributor, and then there's a, a plethora of small kind of, I call them you know, station wagon distributors, where they may have you know, 10 brands and they have one or two people, but you know, they really, their geographic reach is pretty small. But most of it has, they have decreased due to consolidation. Because if you get the story from the place you used to work, that's absolutely buying out smaller. Uh, in the time that I would have been with the company, uh, and really we haven't done a lot of mergers in the last couple of years, but we did 27 mergers in the first you know, 20 years. In your own company. In our own company. So there is an example. And that's just the geography of Oregon and Washington, where every county within every state had its own local distributorship. And at some point, uh, it just made sense for those to, to come under one umbrella and families got out of the business and a, a larger distributorship formed over time. So I think, Christian, are the mega distributors the AB and MC houses? Um, you know, they tend to be, uh, the answer is yes from the brewing side, but oftentimes you have wine and spirits as well that are so large that it could be maybe one brewery 
or one distributorship of a brewery, and you might have the other two being a wine and spirit, or the other one being a wine and spirits house. So across the country, one of the megas is Southern Wine and Spirits that people often hear, and I think they're in 35 states at this point across the country, and they are the largest wholesaler in America uh, with what they cover. But they don't tend to work a lot in the beer business. They do have some craft brands around in certain markets, but typically they're a wine and spirits house. Mm -hmm. Hope that answers the question. So the, the wholesale uh, business, why is it important? You know, it, it, we just literally kind of touched on this. It's a fragmented industry. The wineries, breweries, distilleries, the, uh, the, it used to be that uh, you had, like we said, 50 wholesalers, and they'd all represent a certain number of brands. Well, now you have a smaller number of distributors, and yet think about the complexity of the brands. It used to be just a small number of beer, wine, or spirit brands, and today, you know, there's 3,000 craft brewers in, in America. And so think about how that number's uh, geometrically grown. And then we talked about geographic reach and how hard it is to get to all parts of the state. That is a, it's a, something to not underestimate, that if you have a brand and if you want it to go to retail, you must service every licensee that wants to carry that. And sometimes that's a very, very difficult uh, thing to do. And then the complex account makeup, you know, grocery amounts to 70% of the business or so, on sale 10%, uh, broad market, you know, call it smaller independent grocery 10% and C store 10%. And when you look at that and you say the on sale is 10%, yet it accounts for 2,500 accounts, think about the cost of getting into that if you were an independent and not with a wholesaler. Very, very difficult. If you could write your ticket and you could just service Costco, and chain grocery, you know, you'd look at it and go, wow, that's a money maker. Well, the reality of it is that just doesn't work. It's not the nature of this business. Uh, so that's where wholesalers really fill an important niche. And then complex reporting, uh, both to the customers. Grocery has incredible requirements of what they expect and the lead and lag times for that communication. Uh, and then when it comes to reporting to the state and, and the different ways that have to be reported to the state, Again, if you're trying to do that across many states, let alone within one state, it, it just makes you scratch your head and, and pretty soon you say, I want to try and find somebody I can outsource that to uh, that, rather than trying to do it uh, yourself. And we've talked about multiplying your message, the power of wholesalers when you do your job right uh, and helping them sell, the power of getting that message out. So the question uh, was, do you think that do you think consolidation. the consolidation has hurt uh, the small brewers in spreading to different areas? Uh, you know, I don't. I think that today the willingness of the large beer wholesalers to carry craft is, uh, is probably at its highest level. They see that their domestic beer business is flat or in some cases declining. And so what is spurring the growth is craft breweries and import uh, brands that are really growing. Do you think it is more important for startups to sell primarily to your close proximity accounts, uh, or do you try to spread the, spread the brand as far as you can? Um, I'm an absolutely firm believer that the most important thing that you can have is a healthy, uh, well-developed home market for a lot of reasons. One, it's the least expensive market for you to service. Uh, two, it's a place where you can watch what works and doesn't work so that you can begin to create your kind of your unique selling proposition as you then take that message across the country. Um, and then ultimately, God forbid, if you ever have any problems um, out the gate, it's the fastest place to clean up any problems as well. So again, uh, I think that work in the local market and it'll be your greatest gift. Yeah, well, Ninkasi is a great example. They had hundreds of accounts in their own hometown, Eugene. And they still have hundreds of accounts before they like really went aggressively all over the West Coast. So they built up this, people don't realize that, but they had an extremely strong local base, much more so than many other brands in terms of penetration. Later, almost every single bar in their town has their product. And I look as well, if I go back in time to my earliest days, which will age me, but both Widmer and Deschutes here locally did the same thing. They had a very, very, very strong local market before they began 
um, stepping out, and I think that was really to their benefit that people recognized the brand and they'd heard about it, so they were more apt to uh, to work with it in other markets. So as a wholesaler, um, some of the things <clears throat> that I think that, that are important for you to understand as you're uh, approaching them, you know, how do you get them to say yes? And imagine this: that you know, every day my uh, table in my office would have multiple, up to I'll say probably five to ten a week would hit my desk with people looking for representation in the market. And when you opened up that box, you had a decision to make. And your decision started with the box <laughs> and what was presented to you to what was in the box, the professionalism, etc. And I think people forget that there's so many brands coming at the market that you are thinking, I've got a really great brand. These people are going to be clamoring for it. And the reality of it is that's your first mistake because the world doesn't need your brand. You have to help create the reason for being and the unique selling proposition that starts with getting the wholesaler so interested in that success locally that they'll say yes. And, and people are looking for, is there today, is there a niche being filled? Is there something so that as they walk into the account that they're going to have a reason to be able to say, carry this brand? Example, you know, uh, how many more IPAs specifically need to be made that aren't differentiated in some way because you can walk in with 100 IPAs each day and somebody's going to say, yeah, the only thing new about it is it's new. And so it goes on tap. They sell a keg and they move off to that next new IPA. So really helping um, a distributor see the niche that's being filled and making sure that there's something in this that you're over-delivering in quality or in image or in marketing for the money. Some reason that's going to bring a consumer back and as a result make a wholesaler interested in carrying the brand. And when you look at the marketing tools and activities, marketing tools are demos. So wet demos in stores depending on the state that you're in where they're allowed, you know, that's it's simply the most uh, effective thing that you can do. If you can get it in their mouth and get consumers to try it, there's nothing more that you want as a brand owner than that. And then providing the right POS and reviews and doing dinners uh, in the market are all things that sound kind of glamorous and after you know a few months as a brand owner, you're going to think the last thing I want to do is another dinner and another demo. So they are the most effective but they also are literally your time. And they're, as a brand owner, they're the things that you could do to differentiate yourself. And a distributor doesn't do that well. They, they don't do that portion of the business well, a demo or a dinner, because only you or someone on your team can really tell that story. Or if you use, uh, there's some local companies that you can hire, and then you spend the time training them so that they can be that mouthpiece for you in the store. Oh, did, along those lines, I was actually thinking, you know, I just went to the cider event here in Portland on a uh -huh. Saturday, yeah. and um, I was sitting in the booth for the Northwest Cider Association, and all the other booths there, uh, only two of the 20 booths had um, someone affiliated with the business, and for me, that made a big difference. I want to actually talk to the owner and hear more about it, and I think that, you know, a lot of people kind of like, they get too busy, they don't want to go to all the events, but when you're starting up, you should probably go to those festivals and at least have somebody from your team in the booth instead of relying on their volunteers. And I know it's crazy in Portland, there's like a festival every weekend, but in many other cities it's the same. But to be at some of the key festivals in the booth is a big help for people. Enthusiasm is the prime form of persuasion without pressure. And when you're behind a booth and you're enthusiastic and you're telling your story, there's nothing that makes a consumer more connected to you than that. So you're right, there, there are a lot of time and energy that goes into them, but I think they're the most effective. Uh, the last thing there, once again, comes back to how active will winery, brewery, distillery need to be in the market. And I think it's the single greatest uh, attribute that you can bring is both your time, your money, and your attention to the market, but making sure that you have a healthy, vibrant home market. There's just nothing better, and I can count or recount a whole lot of stories where people haven't done that and they've come to Oregon because they know it's the craft beer mecca and they do nothing else and brands fail rather rapidly. So how do you set yourself apart in a, in a sea of beverages? When you look at that 
picture there from a wholesaler's warehouse to tap handles to a shelf set and all of those different brands. To me, that unique selling proposition and a way in which you convey that message to your consumer um, is really important. And when you think about that, it goes back to everything from your packaging to your pricing to uh, the POS tools. All of those things come into play. And uh, I think oftentimes people forget that and they think, I really designed a cool package. Everybody is going to love this. I just know they will. They have to love it because it's mine. And the reality of it is not so. Uh, question was, how popular would a small craft brewery have to be for you to come to them, or is that unheard of if they had no distributing? You know, right now, uh, not uncommon at all. Uh, our organization here uh, in Oregon has recently picked up brands that were only on the coast in a specific market or only in a little small community in the downstate market of Oregon where the brand was literally just in uh, one town, a Medford or a Eugene. And so we've actively gone after picking up both uh, beer brands, wine brands, and spirit brands in that fashion. So as you look at uh, going to an out-of-state uh, you know, distributor checklist, to me, this is your moment of, uh, you know, you need to have absolute clarity because in, before you go to the wholesaler, you need to have a plan because if you go to the wholesaler and you're one of those brands that has no plan, then you're going to be one of those brands that they're going to say no to. So how do you get that? You know, first you need to make sure that you're all registered and you should know whether or not there's franchise laws in place because I like to say that in the franchise state, unless there's a willing seller, there can be no willing buyer. And what that means is that if you're in a franchise state and you put a brand in a distributor and they don't want to let you go to another distributor because you're not happy with them, you cannot leave. And so it's really important that you do your work on the front side, know if it's a franchise state, and then and if there's barrelage or gallonage limits that are over, you know, where you are franchised or unfranchised, et cetera. But, and do all the, the state compliance first before you even begin to go any further. And then go and get understanding of the market dynamics. You don't have to visit, although it's great if you can, but pick up the phone and, and find a friend or two who can put you in contact with a restaurant tour, with a bottle shop, with a great tavern. Maybe it's another brewery you call and ask for them to help you um, understand the market, what percent is in the grocery channel, what percent is in the on-premise, the tavern, the C-store, and then um, who are the best wholesalers and why. So if you do that work in advance, you're going to enter through the doors and you're going to be able to be a bit on the offensive instead of feeling like you're walking into this big wholesaler and that you're kind of having to listen to their pitch. You can instead sort of in a way, turn the tables and be able to have a really vibrant dialogue where you're asking as many questions of them as they are of you. But the questions you're asking are, I'll call them intelligent questions that show that you're a well-versed person in their market in this industry. And that is missing. And I can't tell you how many times I sit with people and I'm very polite. I was raised that way. But I really wish about eight minutes into the presentation that I could get up and leave because they've shown me they know nothing about the business, nothing about the market, and I, I don't have the time to educate them. Uh, we're all very, very busy today. So with that, then after you get the, uh, the understanding of the market dynamics, the wholesaler, then it's, you know, you make a decision and you need to get in and you need to talk about the kickoff meeting and what's that look like. And really to me, if you think about it, uh, whether you're married, unmarried, dated, or otherwise, everybody remembers a first impression. And this is your first impression. And you're going to have a, a large sales force in front of you. And it's your time to shine or it's your time to fail. And if you haven't rehearsed that kickoff meeting in a way like, it's, like you're acting, you're going on stage, and if you don't deliver your message and your unique selling proposition and everything that's so cool about you, then I promise you, you're, you're just going to be the, the flavor of the day. So and, I must know what USP stands for. Oh, USP, unique selling proposition. So I always just tell people, if, if you can't tell people in a two-minute elevator ride 
you know, everything there is to know on why they should buy your product, then you don't have a very clear strategy, marketing or otherwise, in your brand. So you should be able to get it down to a real finite, quick elevator pitch. And when you're in front of them, you need to talk about how you're going to support them. They need to understand how to get in contact with you, what are the tools you have, how do they get those tools, and then market visits. When will you be there? If they need you, how, uh, how uh, easily available are you? And how willing are you to work with customers who want to carry your brand? Because again, the best connection you can have uh, to a customer is your own connection. Distributors can do it, but you're going to have the best connection of all. Liz, Liz was asking you to provide an example of a success story of a craft brand you've worked with that, where you really nailed it. <laughs> My best success story. You know, uh, I would go back in time to uh, New Belgium Brewing, and New Belgium was on a, they were identifying markets that they wanted to go into. They were still on their front side of growth and development, a little bit like the Widmer and Deschutes, and they came with a plan, and we sat down and we crafted a market plan together, and I tell you, uh, their position in this Northwest market really, really was great, but they'd also done it by creating a healthy home market. You look at everything around their hometown in Fort Collins, and you, you just went, wow, everywhere you walked in when you visited, you found New Belgium. You heard the story, they were out in the press. All of that stuff came together and made all of our collective's jobs that much easier. What year did they come into the Oregon? It would have been, uh, well, specifically, Oregon, Washington was probably, I'm going to ballpark, 2001. Oh. 2000. Huh. Right in that area. At the lake. They had come into the market in Washington, mm -hmm. and because the demand was so high up there, they exited the market oh, uh, okay. because they couldn't keep up. And then it was a couple of years before there was a re-entry, but there was a great plan, and they had really nailed the healthy home market mm -hmm. um, in Colorado that so many people just forget. They start producing beer, wine, or spirits, and all of a sudden they realize it's building up in a warehouse and they've got too much inventory, and now it becomes, how do I get this out? And it's a little too late at that point. You really need to be working on that healthy home market first. So selling, I just wanted to cover um, a few things because I think that people oftentimes forget um, some of the simple things uh, about, in, in pre-planning a call, uh, if either this is you, when you're selling your own brand um, in your own market, and it also then transcends over to when you start working with a wholesaler. But if, if you're not uh, pre-planning your work, typically you get what you deserve, right? You're, you're going to get an undesired result if you're not uh, working in advance to create what it is you want out of that call. And then, you know, as you kind of work your way down through each of these, they, they they probably uh, are in some ways uh, self-explanatory. But as you go down, uh, I would say the couple of things are, one, acting on your commitments. I mean, it's just like anything in, in life. What people are used to seeing is salespeople coming through the door every day. So as they give you one or two things to do as a follow-up, it may be that they're just testing you along the way, and this is the same with the wholesaler. They may ask you a couple things, and if you're slow on the draw, or if you're, you lack attention to detail, guess what? You're probably not going to get the follow-up. And also, understand that typically that sales cycle is, you know, it's a one through eight, and guess what? At the end, it's not a sale. It's a, here's what you've now learned as the objections from the buyer, and you need to go back to, all right, step one, now that I know what he's told me he doesn't want or she doesn't want or wants, I need to go back and start all over again, and I'm going to go back in to make a call next week uh, and finally try and close the deal. So the question was, how much does that hurt the relationship with the wholesaler when you overreach and need to withdraw from a market? You know, um, I would say that in today's market, it would be far more devastating than it was 
prior. You, you almost had a little bit of that because the competition wasn't as great, so it was a, a little bit easier to do. Today, the hardest thing to get is either shelf space or tap handles. And once you kind of trip up, uh, you're going to have some explaining to do to people on why that happened. There's plenty of people nipping at your heels, so yeah. to fill that shelf space. For good, sure. Good question, Ted. So I, again, in planning tools, what I wanted to show is that there's some things uh, that you should expect that you should use if you're out presenting to customers, as well as what you should look for in your wholesaler. And if you don't see that either you or they are using daily pre-planning tools at some level, then you're probably dealing with somebody who's flying by the seat of the pants. And if you do that, again, I say just don't be surprised with your results. Because if you don't plan, I guarantee you that you'll get something. It just may not be what you plan for. And so working with daily planning tools and however the depth of planning you want to do is really up to you. But just like planning your day and what's important every day, when, this, when that focus is not being applied, you will generally not get uh, the results that you want. And also knowing that planning requires adjusting on the fly, that after you've done this, you're, you're likely to find out that you didn't get what you want. So you go back to square one, you re-plan, you pre-plan, and in doing so, surprisingly enough, the next time you get the results you were looking for. So I just wanted to put a plug in for our distribution class that we're going to be having later this year in February. We're going to be going through creating all those kind of planning tools for distribution. So just oh, doing great. a high-level um, view today, but you know you have the chance for those of you who really want to get into distribution to take a whole class on that. And, and I will reinforce and echo that, that if you either A, are a brand owner, or B, plan to be in this business, take that course, because it will be a gift that will give you a leg up when you walk through the door of either an account or a wholesaler. Really, really an important one. And you'll look uh, uh, so much more intelligent than the, the other 42 people coming in for either a presentation or a job interview. So uh, how to plan in the market, I'm going to do just a quick top look at it. But it's really important to understand in the chain environment what the chains are and how they're clustered. And the word clustering means that in, I'll use an example again, close to home, Safeway. Safeway has five clusters of stores, and they're based upon demographics and the sheer size of the shelf in the store. So everybody can think of that small local store in the market, and they can think of the large chain store in the market. Well, even within chains, they have across the country that same dynamic. So Safeway has the one through five in a cluster one. You need to understand that's the highest demographic. They're going to have the largest set. They're going to have the most expensive items available all the way down through to the lower end. But that's typically where you'd begin is in a cluster one store. So understanding that, that there's clustering and understanding how they do that is important for you to know that I'm going to get into cluster one once I'm successful. I'm going to go into two, then eventually into three, four, five. And the difference is in a Safeway, again, I'll use local market, there's 112 Safeways. Cluster one and two amount for 27 stores. So you're going to start there, you're going to prove yourself, and then you're going to work your way up over time. And that time is probably a two-year period at least before you would go to one through five. So once again, when you get into those stores, you go do the wet sampling. You get it in people's mouths. You ensure that you're successful. And the next thing you know, come the time that you're talking to the buyer again, they say, hey, I want, I want your brand. I saw that it worked really well. Let's go further down into the stores. Broad market, understanding how to get into and visit with bottle shops and independent grocery. Every one of those is a one by one by one sales call. Typically, they're not, when you call on those people, you're making one sale. You're not making 112 sales like the Safeway. So understanding and knowing how you're going to know what are the best accounts that you want to be in in every market. Um, you want to be in the top 10 bottle shops, the top 10 independent grocery. And what I tell people is that as you come to the market, make it a point to know maybe it's 10 chain, 10 bottle shop, 10 independent grocery, and 10 on-premise customers and make them your friends. 
so that on every visit you rotate through those and over time you keep adding to that and it's amazing how they will become your ambassadors when they believe in you as well as your product. Uh, we talked a little bit about tracking, but some of the things that you can uh, you know, plan to see are, and I'll say that it's not without asking, because whether you're the wholesaler or the supplier, not everybody wants to necessarily provide all of this, and quite frankly, depends on the size of the company coming to the wholesaler as to what level of information they will give freely. Uh, and I don't mean freely like without cost, but that without some real pushing and prodding for you to get it. But you should be able to see all of these kinds of things that allow you to have a better understanding of how your brand is doing within the wholesaler, within the market, and then also to be able to see what's happening in the market in a competitive set you know, with ads and planners and, and what's going on there. Uh, within this wholesaler, there's a most today, uh, the mid-size and above wholesalers have automated online systems so that you can get on 24-7 and you can see how your brand is doing. Literally, in our business, it's, it's the same data I'm looking at. So there's no filters on it. Uh, you can call me and you can be reading me the right act when you don't like the data or you could be coaching me to success. How you choose to use that is probably how well we'll do after the fact. And if you continue to beat somebody with that data, they're probably not going to want to work real hard for you. But if you continue to work with them and help them see where there's opportunity rather than where they're not, uh, but help them spot the opportunity and offer your assistance, it's amazing the power of those tools uh, that, again, sometimes if you don't ask, you won't know that they're uh, they're out there. And supplier role. When, when you talk about setting yourself apart uh, in the in the beverage in the uh, in the market, what you we talked about, and I'm going to kind of reiterate some of these things, is number one, that unique selling proposition. If you again can't recite it in two minutes or less, and then hopefully it's 30 seconds, but if you can't do that, then you really need to step back and try and rethink what it is you're trying to do. Because imagine if it takes 30 minutes of you explaining the history and the heritage and the romance behind your brand, you probably lost somebody at hello. And so you really need to, to practice that. And then creating the price value relationship. Again, it can't be just that everyone in your family, your three sisters and your two brothers and aunt Matilda have told you that it's really good for the money. You really need to get out and talk to others and make sure that you are creating a, a price value relationship in that that will get people coming back for more. Make sure that you've got the appropriate sales tools and keep them current. Uh, there's nothing, I think, more frustrating as a wholesaler than finding out that the fact sheet that their sales team is out with is from, you know, quote, two versions ago, whether that's vintages in wine or renditions of the brewing process, et cetera, and they've got out-of-date tools. Talked about developing the relationships. Figure out who those 50 accounts are and make sure that you're getting to know them. Learn what they need and learn about from them in those lines of questioning. How's the market changing? How are you going to evolve? Because your evolution is not only with the customer, the end consumer, but also with the wholesaler. So if all of those, if you're not listening for the subtle changes in the market, you'll probably again get passed by. Today's environment has never been any more competitive, and I'd like to say that all you have to do is get a wholesaler and, and you know sell a couple of cases, and you'll be amazed at what happens. The reality of it is, it is in today's beverage business, it's never been harder. To, to actually make it work and to make it in a sustainable way. There's a lot of one-offs where people get into a market, it's an instant flash, and then all of a sudden it ends. So how are you going to be engaged and create a sustainable model over the long time, a long haul? And in communication in your relationships, I think we have, whether it's your, your marriage, your work, wherever, it's communication can sometimes feel uh, like it's uh, like people are trying to just point out the bad. And I always say, if you start with assuming the good in your relationship and that no one's trying to do something to you, that you'll have a much better relationship with your customer 
and with your wholesaler and ultimately with your end user. But again, people uh, come in oftentimes and that the way that they approach it, it's as if they're the victim the moment they walk through the door. And how many of you like to work as in that role? It's not very fun. But when you feel like you're enthusiastically supported, you're congratulated for your good work, you're encouraged in the areas that you're not doing so well, and you're supported by hearing what they're going to do to help you beside you, there's nobody I want to work with harder. I'll run through a wall for you if that's the approach. And we may get it wrong a couple of times, but if you assume the good in the person to start, I think you'll have a much different outcome. Oh, you know, I, I'm going to go back one to say uh, that last part. Sometimes communication in today's world of wholesale and retail can feel very uh, odd because it feels like, again, like a black hole. It goes into a buyer and you never get a response or you get a one-word response or even within the wholesaler. And what I would encourage you to do is when you're in with wholesaler or retailer, actively ask, how can I best communicate with you? And once you know that, then remain committed to that. And if they tell you email between 11 p.m. and midnight is the right time, then set it for a delayed response and, and start you know, sending it then. Or, hey, I only do text or whatever it may be. Follow that and you'll be amazed at your results. Sometimes you continue down one path and the next thing you know, you're completely frustrated and you think you've got a bad relationship when what it is is you didn't listen. So. Compliance with TTP, and I have the OLCC here specifically, I will tell you that it's very, very important to understand that nothing is worth your license. Whether you're a wholesaler or a manufacturer, everyone abides by the same rules, and just because you're small doesn't mean you can do something that is against the law or something that, hey, they'll never see. I will tell you that uh, whoever is involved they're both parties or more parties are guilty. If a supplier, let's say a small brewery, actively goes in and offers an enticement to a, a, an account to do business, when that is caught, then both people will be punished for that action. Not just the brewery or winery or distillery and not just the customer. And then, you know, if you add a third tier in, if the wholesalers involved, all hell breaks loose with the, the uh, alcohol tobacco groups where they're very very watchful over whether people are being compliant so I can't uh, I can't uh, emphasize that enough make sure you know the laws because oftentimes people just don't realize what they're doing is illegal they think that I came from the food business and in the food business I could give a t-shirt away and that's fine well in many many states if you give a t-shirt away it's considered an enticement you're breaking the law so you need to be very, very careful there. Also, exclusivity. I don't know of any markets where you can be exclusive. So if you go in and say, hey, look, if you'll put my product on and my product on only, or I'm going to do a special event in a stadium and I want you to pour only my product, if you do that, exclusivity is against the law. And I, again, I can't imagine that there's a market that I'm missing where you can do that. So just make sure you understand in the alcohol business, no slotting is allowed. Uh, you can't pay for shelf space. You can't pay for tap space. And if you do, you're breaking the law. And uh, many of you who are in the industry may understand that. And those of you who don't, I would just encourage you to make sure you ask the questions when you're working with a wholesaler. What do I need to know about all the laws? And I don't think any wholesaler would necessarily expect you to know all the subtleties. They're happy to explain that side of it to keep everybody compliant. Oh, and by the way, I know we have a student from Spain. Some of these things do not apply. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and in China, China has massive slotting fees to get onto shelves with alcohol. Right, and we're, we're, you're right. Yeah. whereas in the U.S., yeah. so not this the case. This is for U.S. So, you know, as I like to tell people, I'm 27 years into this business, and I feel like a, a very blessed person to have been a part of the industry. It's a great career. Uh, you can craft an entire career whether it's in the wholesale business or the alcohol beverage business, uh, jump in with both feet. It's really uh, wonderful. You can start as a supplier, you can start as a wholesaler, a, a retailer, and it can, uh, you, know, you, can, you can cross back and forth for years. 
and I close on that part by saying, you know, it's a chance I often say to live a, a millionaire's life on a uh, just a standard wage uh, in the business because the places that you can travel around the world locally, the places you get to, whether it's, you know, go golf or whether it, you know, pick it, the fun things you can do that you might not be able to do otherwise, it's really a wonderful industry uh, to be a part of. And there's a question, do distribution contracts allow you to self-distribute along Side the distributor, assuming you were printed to in your state, or are they truly wholly exclusive? Uh, it, it really depends. Uh, that answer is it's really up to what you've negotiated within the, the confines of the laws in a market. I'll tell you that if I owned a distributorship, uh, I can't think of too many instances where I would want self-distribution alongside the distribution unless they were clearly defined as to a channel of trade or some other uh, specific definition so that what we didn't do is get into a spot where eventually I think you're trying to take my business, you think I'm trying to take your business, and we really just blow up a, what was a perfectly good relationship. So if properly crafted, it could work, but I would say just make sure you think it through to the worst end and think through how can you define things so that there'll never be any lack of clarity on that. Mike. So I can give you an example, Mike, with our brewery in Park City, Wasatch. We had a major chain store down the street, grocery, Albertsons in Utah, and we were allowed to handle our package product on the shelf there because we were a block away and we wanted to keep it filled all weekend and for special events and all that because everybody was coming to Park City and going to that one grocery store if they wanted to buy package product. So our distributor let us handle that one store and they handled the kegs in the town and the kegs all over the state and the package product all over the state. But the one grocery store we did a huge amount of volume we were allowed to do that one store because we were a block away from them and we knew. You well, carved it out. Yeah, we carved yeah. it out. So, worked well for them because they didn't want to handle weekend service to Park City from Salt Lake. Worked well for us because we had a van and we could handle going back and forth to the brewery in that store like every three days. So the one comment or question I didn't see was, seriously, dude, take a breath. I, I know I covered a lot of, uh, of information and I, I may have talked a lot, but I, I really there's a, a whole bunch of things I wanted to cover and I hope you found some of the information uh, useful. There is another question. What's the best way to set up a meeting with a distributor or do you simply require a sample to be sent in first? No, you know, the way I would do that is uh, I would first start by doing those things that I said by exploring in the market and making sure you understand everything before you set up your meeting. Because once you have your meeting, you only get one first impression. So in your conversation with the accounts that you talk to, once you decide who you're uh, going to meet with, then typically what I do is I, I suggest to people, hey, find out who that customer's favorite uh, distributor rep is and see would they be willing to help, you know, give you a plug so that when they, you know who to call, and that that person's expecting your call. So hey, you know, uh, Sam down the street uh, would really uh, recommend that you meet with this craft guy, up and coming, really cool brewery, uh, expect his call. And then when it comes in, there's a connection from a customer who said they have an interest as well. So, and then from that, the first thing the distributors can say, hey, before you, you come in, would you, you know, shoot some samples in the mail so that when we get together, I'll have a little bit more information to be able to uh, have a conversation with you. So besides product, what else would they ex be expected to send in the mail? You know, I would say just make sure that your, your letter, in your opening letter, just at least explain, hey, here's what I've sent you and then here's what I'm going to bring in person. I didn't want to just clog up your office, but I'm going to bring with me some POS, some of our marketing pieces, or whatever it may be that you want to bring separately. So just a clear professional introduction letter in that box, rather than just some duct tape over the top, and when they open it, they have no clue who it's come from. Yeah. Even. And trust me, it happens. No one can imagine. It does. <laughs> I know some of the characters. Yeah. Any other questions? we got a minute left. Everybody's overwhelmed with information about distribution? No? No, and I will say if there's anything one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, that I can help any of you with personally, 
uh, in this career or uh, the industry, please let me know. I'd be happy to uh, help each of you individually. Oh, let's see. Josh says, as a distributor, what styles of beer are you most excited to bring on? You know, uh, stylistically, uh, boy. <laughs> That, that's a really, that's a, such, it's a broad question. It, it's really more brand and what the niche is that a brand is um, filling. Uh, right now, there's a really strong interest in Belgian-style beers, for sure. And I think what it is is that as people continue to graduate up the scale from, you know, pedestrian Pilsner all the way up to, you know, more complicated styles, just like in the wine business, uh, people are graduating up and finding out, wow, this is pretty cool, what I can, what I can do in the different areas within beer. Your perception of the amount of IPAs on there. <laughs> uh, my perception uh, is that it just seems every time I turn around, there's another round of IPAs, and I have not seen a lot of uh, styles, of new cool styles coming. And some of this is innovation, and, and I would encourage people to think outside the box and say, what is it that isn't invented yet? What is it that hasn't been created, and how can I create that niche that maybe it's a, you know, brownie fudge porter that nobody's doing yet? Bad idea, trust me. <laughs> but I'm just saying, come up with something that could, you know, have some commercialization to it down the road, and be thinking outside of what's already been done. And finally, Ryan has asked twice what styles are increasing in popularity. Um, the right below it says sours. No, not yet on the sours. I think that's such a uh, an acquired taste for sure, but in the in that Belgian style, whether it's doubles, triples, uh, and bottle conditioned, you know, products in general, I think the complexity in those is definitely interesting. Uh, and then, absolutely, I'd be lying if I didn't say IPAs are popular, right? They're still very popular, but in, in a sea of, of IPAs, how are you going to make yourself different now if you're just coming into it? Oh, great. Well, I'm going to give you one of our lovely thank you gifts. Business of Craft Brewing t-shirt. Right on. Thank you. <laughs> You're Thanks welcome. for having me, class. Thanks for letting me be here. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Enjoy. everybody, for joining us tonight. And hopefully we'll see you live in the 402 class. Thank you. Thanks.